Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and by Die Hard. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to MotorWeek podcast number 105. Thanks for joining us and in Studio C at MotorWeek Central today. I have our assistant producer, Greg Carlos. Hey, hey. World traveler that he is. Our writer, Patrick Lucas. I'm feeling alive for number 105. Oh! That's why they pay me the big bucks. All those creative types. He is a writer after all. Our over-the-edge reporter, Zach Mescal. Hello there. And our special guest, again, for two podcasts. Seems like you were just here. (laughs) He came right back. Editor-in-chief for Cars.com, Patrick Olson. Patrick, welcome. Thanks, John. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I can see why you want to come back. We're, we're pretty cool guys, right? <laughs> I, every year I I'm back so. here, like, like a bad penny. <laughs> and we hope that keeps you keep coming back. Okay, we've got our uh, lightning round. We'll also touch on a viewer question. But first, we've got lots of cars. And we're going to start with um, a car that I like a lot because I think it's so well executed. And that's the uh, 2015 Cadillac ATS Coupe. Um, I went on the preview for it, was very impressed that Cadillac had not messed up the ATS sedan. If anything, I think the Coupe's got – is a little bit better. Uh, it seems it has a slightly uh, slightly more performance all the way around, slightly stiffer ride for more sporty appeal. All of you guys have had a chance to sample it. Uh, what do you think? ATS, another Coupe, is, is it a, a worthy contender in this very European uh, Coupe market? Uh, is it a car that Cadillac maybe didn't need but felt like they had to make? What do you think? It is still a worthy contender. Uh, when it came out three years ago, um, it was indeed. I think it still is. What well, do you um, mean, the ATS sedan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Two. Two. Yeah, it was 2013. 2013. Right? Yeah. All righty. Um, That's right. You're young. Years don't mean anything to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was just yesterday. I think it's a great-looking car. It drives nice. Um, it's simple and clean and well done. The lines aren't too crazy on it. Um, so when you let me ask you, because I know you're really into the look of cars. When you look at the ATS Coupe and you see what they did with two doors, and none of the body panel except the hood are carryover, do you think it looks like it's akin to the ATS? Do you think it looks better, worse, some different? Is it? Is the car logical to you? It looks less aggressive. It doesn't look fast to huh, me. Interesting. But it looks like it would cruise nice, uh, if that makes sense. Well, sure. It's, it's interesting because usually the coupe is the one you find looks sleeker or a little more aggressive. Exactly. Yeah. The one thing I find interesting is I think only Cadillac has really nailed the uh, the coupe or the sort of aggressive sports car where Lincoln can't seem to get their hands around it. No. And Alpha may be the answer for Chrysler, but it isn't there yet. Between the CTS coupes and now uh, this, yep. I mean, they they seem to have figured out that these are prestige cars, and they've got to look really. It made striking. them very desirable. I think yeah. they're great fun to drive. Um, the interiors are really well done. They're cohesive. They're not sort of just slapdash together. So I give them credit for it. I rode around with one of the designers of the ATS coupe, and and he was drilling me about you know the looks, and I think the car looks in a way. I agree with you both a little conservative compared to the sedan but he did point out that it's got wider tracks and the back end is they made that more muscular so going away from you you actually have a pretty good image of the car and i think he's right but the front is a little uh, especially with the new big cadillac crest which is like <laughs> oversized yes. what about you two um i like patrick said the interior is uh, what always impresses me yeah. with uh, these new cadillacs um I gotta say, the more I use the Q system, I I hate it every time I use it more and more. I don't know why. It's just I totally agree. It's just gets more. It seems cool and it looks cool. It looks very futuristic. But the more you use it, it's just it's frustrating. Yeah. Is, is it the same thing we've talked about before with the voice recognition? Or no, what? no, because I don't even mess with the voice recognition half the time. It's just you know, it's got that proximity thing where it brings up all the buttons once it senses your hand mm-hmm. in front of it. But even still, I mean, it just felt very far away. I had to. I'm, I'm gesturing. You guys can't see this, um, but <laughs> like you, you extend your arm, and it's almost out of hands, out, mm-hmm. out of arm's reach. Um, There's a fair amount of lag too on command. Yeah, when you touch agree, something, yeah. you're, yes. and you're waiting for it to sort of do a drum roll and, and do mm-hmm. all six commands you've already plugged in. Yeah, it's it's not consistent enough for me. Like uh, like Patrick said, the Patrick Lucas, our Patrick. Um, <laughs> The more you use it, it seems like it frustrates you more because I feel like when I got when I get in it for the first time, it's it works 
better than I expect, and then I expect it to work good, right. and it doesn't. It's, it, it just starts doing things that I don't want it to do, and it is really frustrating. But back to the good points of the yeah, car. Yeah, that's a very small point. It's, yeah, because I actually like it. I should point out that I like you. Yeah. So. It's like, like, uh, Maybe it's gauged it. Older drivers <laughs> no, who, move, a, who move at a certain who speed, move at a slower <laughs> pace. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the, uh, the, yeah, I'll go. I'll go back to talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> if I may. <laughs> no, the the interior is locked down, like Patrick Lucas said. Um, the exterior, I was looking at it yesterday, just kind of staring at it. Um, yeah, I, I often do that to cars. I just stare at them for a while, I don't, and I lose track. It doesn't get a lot of work done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but the three quarter view, the three quarter rear view, and the profile view, I think, are the most appealing yeah. for this car. Um, it looks really aggressive when you look at it from that profile. When I you see the that. muscular rear slope down to the more conservative front, as, as you would put it. But um, as far as driving dynamics go, I think it's it's still not quite a BMW in territory. But it, uh, I, th- I haven't driven the two liter the turbo in a while, and I'd like to try that engine in this car because I felt like the V6 and the one that we have is a little bit. It makes it a little bit nose heavy. Well, it, it offers a little bit more power. I feel like, but it, it the actually lighter- torque wise, it actually doesn't. I mean, they they've upgraded the four cylinder turbo now, so it's got more torque than the six. And I, I was frankly disappointed that they sent us the the V6 because to me that's not where this class of car is this class mm-hmm. of car mm-hmm. for enthusiasts is the 2 liter turbo but I guess we'll have to wait maybe till Roebling to get our hands on the 2 liter turbo manual so so alright ATS got a good overall reading from our group and I'm not so sure that we even ought to talk about this car because if anybody's got anything major to say against it I probably will throw them out of the studio <laughs> and that's the 2015 Alfa Romeo 4C the real return of Alfa Romeo to the U.S., four-seat, two-seat sports car, mid-engine, looks like a mini exotic. All right, I know I'm in love with it. What about the rest of you? What's not to love about it? I mean, if you're a car enthusiast, this is it. I mean, All right, could you, you're, you're exactly. well over six he feet. He just said it. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, it's I'm, well. I'm not going to lie to you. It's tough getting in and out. I mean, that's just Oof. you know, yeah. it, it just it comes with the territory. But in, once you're inside of it, it's it's. I love the use of the carbon fiber inside. How they actually polished it and made it look presentable. Unlike the, I'm not comparing it to the BMW i8, but when you would open the door to the i8, the carbon fiber wasn't finished. It was just you know mm-hmm. the way it was. But this is all finished. It's very glossy, good looking, very Italian. The the pedals that I just remembered. I saw a picture of them and it jolting me back to memory driving this car it's like race car pedals they're like uh, aluminum pedals like bare bones they don't try and make them pretty but the fact that they don't try to make them pretty makes them awesome looking the brake pedal you barely touch it and you're on the brakes it's just and the brakes are awesome yeah oh my ridiculous brakes twin clutch manual steering um fantastic turbo sound um 237 horsepower in a car that weighs 25 ish, mm-hmm. 100 pounds. I mean, tons of fun. It's like the opposite of the ATS. It's not the most comfortable. It's not very quiet. Um, but it does feel a little more up to date and it definitely hugs the road. Tons and tons of fun to drive. 22 PSI is what the mm-hmm. 1.7 liter pushes out. And it's right behind your head. So you're hearing every little noise that it makes and it's yeah. glorious. Do, did we have a muffler <laughs> on the one we had? No. I don't think it had no, mufflers. No, no. So, oh, I think yeah. it had a muffler, but it didn't matter the, the way it sounded. I mean, yeah. it's all. Because I think there's two different uh, exhausts. Well, well that was this it. one, the launch edition's got, I think, every option on it. I uh, yeah. I went out. I took it out to do uh, get our GoPro angles, yeah. which uh, we love to do. Um, I barely got my work done because I had so many people stop me and like want to talk about the car. Um, and I was like praying more people to like, I was just like Can I keep going, please. I don't want to talk about it anymore. But and like it was a little awkward getting in and out of it. And but um, I mean, yeah, it, it's an amazing car. You know, and I look at that. I look at the four C, and, and we've got a new Miata coming, and that's going to be you know a big success and it's the quintessential little sports car but this this is like this was an exotic car that's brought down to almost affordable prices and and size and i don't know i haven't been taken with a car and like this in a long time i I don't want to think about what it's going to be like to own it five or six (laughs) years from now but uh, i think all we all agree that the 4c was pretty terrific you think it's a supercar 
if people are a calling it a supercar. Super I mean, I, I don't wouldn't, see how you can I wouldn't I call it that, that because it doesn't have the features. Uh, it certainly doesn't have the price. I mean, the interior is not nearly as bare bones as as some reviewers I think have made it out to be. Uh, but I wouldn't call it a supercar. Supercar to me means I don't know twelve cylinders yeah, something exactly. you know you know something really outrageous. This has got a little four banger with a turbo that just happens to go like spit. All right, uh, speaking of going in a different <laughs> way. <laughs> Amazing. Making a little segue here. Uh, Very nice. Job. Greg is back from a recent uh, Kia first drive, and you drove two vehicles there, um, the Sedona minivan, and I know you want to spend Ooh. about 20 minutes on that, <laughs> and also the Kia Soul EV. So take it away, Greg, and then we'll all chime in. All right, what do we want to start with? Do we want well, to give us, you know, the Sedona, let's, let, a lot of people, everybody hates minivans, but they recognize they're terrific for what they are. Anything special? about the Sedona because this is kind of uh, Kia's re-entry into that market um I mean it's still I mean it's still a minivan so the best compliment you can give a minivan is that it doesn't necessarily drive like one and I think that the Sedona fits in that category well I mean it's it's much more along the lines of a CUV which everybody's used to driving now I mean it's not a powerhouse you're not going to drag race you're not going to take it around and and flog around the corners but in terms of storage and just general looks i mean it's a good looking minivan and if you look at it from certain angles you can actually be tricked into thinking that it is a cuv or something uh, Mm. that isn't a minivan but it's it's very well done they have uh they've upgraded some materials inside on the higher trim levels like they've got napa leather inside which is you know feels really great when you're sitting in a car for hours on end when you're at these press launches uh the back seats have plenty of room with the captain's chair. And, and I, how tall are you, Greg? Um, six three, <laughs> okay, give or take. So that, there, you had some perspective on that. Yeah. So, so Greg, didn't Key go out of its way though to not call this a minivan? Right. They don't like calling it a minivan. They like yeah. calling it a uh, what are they? A multi-purpose vehicle. Right. Right. So yeah. Remember I mean, the first Chrysler minivans were called MPVs. Right. That's right. right. Mazda MPV. Right. Yeah, and MPV. Mazda yeah, did yeah, Mazda MPV, MPV too. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know. They're not going to punch you in the face if you call it a minivan. But they... <laughs> I've been threatened. <laughs> <laughs> Did they? How does the second seat work? It all comes down to me in a minivan is, um, you know, yep. what do you do with the second seat? Is it still heavy that you have to take out? I assume no, it is. No, they have a new system now of it, uh, it. I forget exactly what they call it, and maybe somebody can help me because I'm blanking on the actual name of the, the stow style that they call it. But it slides forward with the seat bottom folding up and it kind of like kind of collapses goes, yeah, yeah and it kind yeah. of goes forward and so you don't have to pull out the seats oh, like in an odyssey or, or yep. things like yeah. that which is a huge deal because uh let's let's be honest there's a lot of of mothers driving this car who don't want to take out that seat and lug it the around and just, seat. Yeah. yeah and there's yeah, absolutely there's a lot of people who don't want to just stow these seats outside of the car and and pick them up so that was actually a really nice thought by kia to make it so easy when they have that second seat folded what is the floor? Is the floor flat, or is there still a hump for that the seat cushion? The floor is flat, yeah. Because a third row will, will right. flop back if, into if the well. If they have yeah. solved that problem, if they've found another way to do, you know, without going into the patents for Stow & Go that Chrysler uses, that's yeah. a big deal. Mm-hmm. What, what I find interesting about the new Sedona is that it's going for appropriately equipped about forty grand. So I had a Sedona I bought brand new in 2004, and I was one of the few who did. But we had it for 10 years. All my mm-hmm. kids learned how to drive on that. Um, and it was nineteen grand 10 years ago, top of the line with everything on it. So I'm eager to see what twice my money will get me a decade mm-hmm. later. Yeah. We're not so sure it'll be twice the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's the marketing gimmick? Uh, uh, the Odyssey had the onboard vacuum cleaner. Well, there's the Ottoman in the second row. Right. Right. Yeah. You, you can get your feet kicked you can, up. Yeah, you can actually, yeah. yeah, you can actually kick your feet up kind of like a business class inside yeah. of an airplane. All right. So that's cool. But, um, Sold. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, well, my kids need a better reason to slouch. Exactly, you know to not mean? get out and do anything. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, we actually spent more time on that than I thought. So now Kia Soul. The Soul EV. Which <laughs> if ever where there was a vehicle that looked like it ought to be an EV, it's the Soul. Yeah, we're, so now we're it just, is. The enthusiasts are just loving this section, talking about minivans and EVs. <laughs> um, but, no, this is actually a, a really nice EV, and I think I've always had a soft spot for the Soul. It's just kind of... A quirky vehicle. It's it's youthful. When you get into one, you can't help but buy into what they they've got going on side or in, inside the on, in the vehicle. But as an EV, it's 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 very nice. You've got 93 miles of range, and that's EPA estimated. Wow. 
Um, yeah, so that's actually more than LEAF a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, 27 kilowatt hour lithium battery. Uh, they did have to lose a little bit of, of um, backseat leg. Room. Yeah, backseat leg. But it was. Room. It must not be very noticeable. I, I remember I sat in it and I was surprised how much room there was. It's, it's really not noticeable. If they didn't tell you, you wouldn't even realize it. And it's because they actually designed the the new soul as an ev so as the ev, EV soul start. and the regular oh, okay. soul were designed right together so it's already a conducive kind of uh shape for to fit a battery there um but in terms of driving i mean torque is is good it's not great off the line but once you're already moving and you want to pass somebody in the city highway it actually offers a nice little uh boost there and um, do they just, give you any idea on prices at uh, 33, it'll start at before, before the tax before incentives, tax incentives, and, and destination, and what have you, and that gives you uh, heated seats, a backup camera. Nice. Yeah, it's well equipped. I was, uh, yeah, I was then, interested in that. Yeah, uh, unlike uh, unlike the uh, Leaf, which has been taking things out. Yeah, right. You can spend two grand more for the Soul EV Plus. It gives you fog lights, ventilated seats, and then it also, I mean, the 33,000 also gets you the fast DC charger, which gets you to 80 percent charge in like 33 minutes. So um, uh, my big takeaway, uh, as an EV, it's much quieter than than the Leaf and even maybe the i3 in terms of just the uh, electric that you hear coming from the motor, just the, the natural sounds that come from an electric motor. Uh, those are taken out, and it is a, it's a quiet and, and comfortable EV. So really... Ah, um, uh, but it doesn't have those i8 doors. <laughs> no, it doesn't have the i8 <laughs> doors. Profile. Which most yeah. people would say, thank goodness. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Okay, I'm going to move on to something a little different for our opening uh, session. Um, Zach, you've just done an over-the-edge piece that I think just about everybody on the staff was very envious of. Downhill go-karting. Tell us about it. Not so motor week. Um, It was through the Maryland Independent Soapbox Federation, just a bunch of goofballs that get together uh, once a month, and they race gravity go-karts downhill. Um, their mission statement, I guess you could call it, uh, says, quote, the most fun is usually had on the outskirts of sanity, somewhere between <laughs> brilliance and mayhem. Uh, they call themselves the downhill misfits. And the car that I raced uh, hit about 60 miles per hour. Then they had these supercars where they lay down and the guys were going 83, 84, wow. 85 wow. miles an hour. Wow on Appalachian back roads in Pennsylvania. And a gravity go-kart. A gravity go-kart. Oh, the start off is how super do they slow. Stop? Uh, there's scrub brakes that okay. they're called. You pull a lever down, and then two pieces of two-by-fours <laughs> get pulled onto the tires. <laughs> so you so smell the straight from rubber 80 burning. Miles an hour? Like it's weren't for two, then. Yeah. But then there's also <laughs> drum brakes. How, how does the navigation system work inside of it? <laughs> no, absolutely nothing. No steering aids. Um, wow. But they are uh, roll bar equipped. Um, Five point harnesses um, mm. had to wear a neck guard. So it's a race car. Legit helmet. And it you're, is a race car. You're decked car. out like you're in a race car. And I'm telling you what, after they sent me videos and I saw these guys uh, breaking their tibia, fibia, messing up their knee, getting staples in their heads, busting out ribs. When these things wreck, they wreck. It is serious business. And I, w- I didn't think I was going to be scared, but as soon as I started moving, man, my adrenaline was pumping so fast. They took us on these back roads, and I was like, I'm going to try not to hit the brakes. No, I hit the brakes, man. It was scary, <laughs> scary stuff. But I haven't had that much fun in a long time. I mean, it was just so much fun. It was crazy. And these guys used to do this illegally, but now they actually get permits through the states. So this, the one, the event that I was just in was called the East Coast Challenge. <laughs> I was going to say, is from this California, more... Georgia? So they this is now a national thing. Seas. Yeah, this is a big thing. And a lot of people don't know about it. When I first heard about it, I was skeptical. And now I think I'm going to start going out once a month with these guys. Whoa, a new convert. Yeah. I can't Jeez. wait to see the segment. Yeah, don't, uh, don't borrow my helmet anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to come back in like three pieces. All right. I don't think I have a transition for that, for this. But we're going to move on to uh, our lightning round where our panelists have roughly two minutes or until we decide to make everybody shut up to debate a trending automotive topic when you time is up. You will hear the bell, and here we go. I was blown away this past couple of weeks when they some new statistics came out about what's going on in the car market. Uh, dealers are reporting that buyers are not opting for anything but top trim levels. The average car going out the door is between thirty two and thirty six thousand dollars, and uh, people are taking five, six, and even seven year loans. 
What's going? What? What, in your opinion, is going on in the car market? Is this sustainable? Is there danger here? What's your experience with this? I mean, it seems like talking about. I mean, the average car we get in to test is over thirty, but we all have always assumed that the automakers load them up. But that seems to be what people want. Well, I'd say one thing that's very clear is that leasing is at historic highs. So normally. Pre-recession, it was about 20% of cars. It's above 30% now. And I think... For all cars in general. For all cars in general. That's a lot. Yeah, it's it's huge. And I think that's where people, whether it's a company paying for it or people deciding that as cars have gotten better, the residual values stay higher, turn to a lease, and I can get more stuff on my car, so I'll go for the higher trim. Um, But, you know, I, I have to believe we're seeing the crest of new car sales because it's not sustainable. Incomes aren't up. Housing uh, values aren't up that much, so no one's got equity. It's it's definitely got to come down at some point. Guys, any comments from your um, your friends or your own personal I mean, experiences? I don't know about buying, but I just know that going on a lot of these events and constantly, you know, pricing out cars for when I, we write about them and review them. There's a lot of things where they the best features that they offer or the best packages that they offer aren't available unless you get these other packages so you lump, right. so you, they're like almost pre, prerequisite so yeah i mean if you want everything they advertise you're gonna be walking out the door with a top trim level the dealers say people don't care what the price of the car is they're only <laughs> I, you know, this is what <laughs> dealers have said <laughs> forever <laughs> right. that it's all about the monthly payment and and when you go in and try and negotiate a price you often hit a brick wall but they are saying that that's more true now than ever and I think that's true. You know, the average car loan now is now 64, 65 months, right. well over five years. And I think it's because people have more faith that the car is going to last that long. I remember mm-hmm. 10, 20 years ago, you didn't want more than a five-year loan because you're like, well, I want it till the warranty stops, and then I want to be able to get rid of that car so that none of that's on me afterwards. And I think now people think, oh, I, I have faith that these cars are going to last. But seven years? That's, I'm not sure I would do that. That's but, crazy you know. to me. I mean, I remember my parents telling me, like, you know, when I'm starting to learn about you know, what a loan even was, it's like you buy a car, it's a three, four year mm-hmm. loan, maybe right. we'll see what happens. But seven and years. And you celebrated I mean, and the day that you paid it right. off. You know? I, yeah. Like, maybe it's just the way I think, but if I were to go in and, and buy a car on a seven year loan, I'm thinking, I'm immediately depressed after I bought that car. I was like, I'm paying for this car. For seven years. Right. Well, and there's a danger there, right? That if you take that car in seven years and you've put a bare minimum down payment on it, you are going to be upside down um, and, you know, have a, have a devastating crash. If you don't have the right insurance, you could be on the hook for the difference between what it costs to replace the car and what the car was worth, which is dropped thousands of dollars when you drove it off the lot. Absolutely. Speaking of which, one of the big uh, aspects that um, is forcing a lot of the car prices up are new safety features. And we've got a question from Chet uh, Zako. He's kind of uh, new. He's getting back into the car market after not being in it for a long time. And he's rather befuddled with some of the new safety features that are on cars. And I know we talk a lot about these driver assistant uh, systems, but let's go around the table and think, you know, if you were could spec out a car, is there one or two safety items that you've seen in here that you would say, hey, I like to have it, and maybe a couple that you think is over the top? Oh, I have my answer pre-prepared. I already know. Okay. I love blind spot monitoring. Um, I hate lane departure warning. <laughs> um, Agreed. So I would, I would, that's, that's my stance on those two. But what I just found out was we've just been testing the Genesis, the automatic right. braking, with the new barrier that we've got, which hopefully will work its way into the show soon. Really impressive with that, how it works, how consistently it works. That's something that I would legitimately consider. Yeah, automatic braking on a lot of cars is being brought in in conjunction with uh, uh, radar cruise control. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety has now done their first test, and it's working its way down to affordable cars very quickly. That Genesis was amazing. From 25, 20, and down to 15 and 10, it stopped two feet before the barrier every every time. Every single time, yeah. It was very impressive. I got a quick question for you guys. Mm -hmm. As automakers try with crash avoidance systems in a way to make cars idiot-proof, will that make drivers into idiots? And what I mean by that Uh, is, will that make everyone assume that – this car is going to save me for myself. I absolutely think that's the case, and it's it's scary almost because um, you know 
it's almost like they're advertising that you can get in this car and not pay attention, and you'll probably be fine. And that's well, not, I think that's the whole autonomous that's, driving that's, thing, yeah, isn't it? Right. That's that not the way to go and about and it, and I think that's sad. And, um, I, and I've even noticed it in myself, and not to that degree, but since backup cameras have become so prevalent now, I rely on them so much. I look right. down at them, and I, sometimes I, I mean, I hate to say it, but if I'm backing up a short amount, I might not even look out yeah. the, the rearview mirror, and that's not a good thing that you get used to things like that. But, I mean, it, it may well, get to a time where it's just it's so good and it's so consistent with how it works right. that it just, you know. It's like, it's like smartphones. You yeah. swore that you were never going to get addicted to them, and now you are. <laughs> right. And I think backup cameras, we're there on that. Oh, right. no if we doubt. Get, if we get in a no vehicle that, well, that doesn't have one, we just think it's like, well, in a couple of years, they'll be mandatory. Yeah, so. 2017? Yeah. But what I like is the GM system and others and the park assist where you, it's not only the backup, but then it's the sensors and the, yes. and the big arrows that warn you when things are coming. I mean, I'm with you that I don't want to rely on it only, but they're getting so good now that it's really very helpful that way. And it's probably we're probably only a year away from having a front camera and a backup camera on almost everything, and the backup camera actually doubling as your rear view mirror when you're out on the highway. Because right now they Nissan's switch off. Doing that. Yeah. When you're oh, back. I saw that technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the rear view. Yeah. Really, yeah. really impressive. Actually. Yeah, it was really neat. Yeah, yeah. you've been quiet, Zach. Yeah. You're kind uh, of a purist uh, on the staff. What's your take on some of this driver-activated uh, safety stuff? I am more of a purist. I really don't even like trash control. But, Chet, um, <laughs> definitely get out there. And each car maker, everything is going to be different. Um, the automatic braking, I will admit, has saved me once or twice. But it's also gotten me in sticky situations. For instance, somebody was making a slow right turn in front of me, so I went to their left where I had plenty of room because I saw the woman behind me not paying attention. And that almost got me into some trouble. So the automatic braking, you know, just sometimes uh, really aggravates me. But like Patrick said, the, um, you know, rear cross, rear cross traffic monitoring and all that stuff is fantastic. Backup cameras are good, but some of the stuff, uh, no thank you. The takeaway from here is, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's an aid. You can't Amen. rely on it. You've still mm-hmm. got to use your Absolutely. senses. That's right. Okay. That brings to a close our Motor Week 105 uh, podcast. I want to thank Greg Carlos, Patrick Lucas, Zach Mescal, and Patrick Olson for joining us. Patrick, come back anytime. Thanks, John. And thank you very much for listening to our podcast. And be sure to catch Motor Week on most public television stations around the country and also on the Velocity Cable Channel. Till next time, I'm John Davis. Thanks very much for listening. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and by Die Hard. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.